okay yeah so we've um we've given permission i think you need to uh oh there you go yeah yeah I got it thank working. you okay Oh, okay, yeah. So I'll start again for the sake of the recording. Uh, <laughs> um, so my name's Nick Smith. Uh, I'm a doctor. I live in Scotland. Um, here at Concordia Station, I work for the European Space Agency, performing human research on isolation and confinement. Uh, and I'm also the uh, rescue doctor here as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Fabio. I'm an Italian researcher and I work for the Italian National Agency for the New Technology, the Energy and the Economical uh, Sustainable Development. And here in Concordia, I'm at the Italian Glaciologist. Hello to everyone. My name is Rodolfo. I'm in astrophysics. In my life here in Concordia, I have two roles. I am the station leader for this 17th uh, winter campaign. So welcome to Concordia, welcome to Antarctica, everyone. And uh, I'm uh, the physics of, of the atmosphere here in, uh, in Concordia as a scientific role. Hello, I'm Josie. I'm an anesthetist. I'm the doctor of the station. Uh, I take care of the, the crew. Hello everyone, I'm Denis. I'm the French glaciologist. So I take care of the snow sampling, air sampling, and uh, the scientific uh, French instrument. Hello everybody, I'm Marco, and uh, here in Concordia I work uh, for the projects of astronomy, uh, geomagnetism, and uh, seismology. Hi to everyone, I'm David, I'm the ICT, the person that manages all the, the PC and the connection, also satellite connection, uh, and so I'm a ICT guy. Thank you. Um, so there are a few people who aren't here due to work commitments. Um, there is a, a chap named Jean-Francois, he's the leader of the technical team. Um, and he manages the uh, power generation systems and the heat generation systems for the station. Uh, we also have a mechanic here whose name is Charles. Um, he looks after the mechanical systems. We have big bulldozers here um, and other vehicles as well to clear snow and move heavy objects around. Uh, we have Quentin as well. He's a, um, he just, his, his job title is uh, 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 technician polyvalent, which means uh, that he's a multi-skilled technician. Um, he's essentially a welder, uh, and he also does a spot of plumbing and things like that when we need to as well. Um, Cedric is not here as well. Cedric is our electrician, um, so he manages all the electronic and electrical uh, problems on the station as well. Have I forgotten anyone? Oh, and Simone, of course, the most important person on the crew is our cook, uh, who is uh, who I think probably has one of the most difficult jobs on the station. Um, so that's who's missing. Um, so we're a crew of 12. Um, we arrived here in, uh, when did we arrive? November. The 12th, we arrived. Yeah, so we, we arrived on the continent uh, on the 12th, but then uh, had to wait 20, 12th of November, pardon. Um, and uh, flew into Concordia on the 13th of November after a, a month long stay in Hobart uh, in Tasmania, where we had to isolate uh, due to COVID precautions and things like that. So we've actually been in Concordia approaching six months now. Um, we're approaching the middle of winter here because we're Southern hemisphere. So naturally the seasons are the opposite way around. So, and we've got about six or seven months left at the station as well until the, uh, until the summer crew return. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so what we'll do now is I'll, um, uh, Rodolfo is kindly going to scroll through some pictures for us uh, that will just explain a bit about the station, how it works and what we do here. Um, so Concordia Station is uh, a joint project uh, owned by uh, the French and the Italians. Um, so the, the French Polar Institute and the Italian Polar Institute um, set up this station on the top of Dome C um, at high altitude uh, to investigate uh, lots of different types of science here. We do um, astronomy, um, there's glaciology and snow chemistry, um, human research, 
uh, there's atmospheric physics, environmental physics, uh, I'm missing lots, seismology, yeah, um, yeah, geomagnetism as well. So th there's a great many different science projects that we perform here. Concordia Station itself is situated about a thousand kilometers from the coast. Uh, I think, um, uh, yeah, from the French station Dumont d'Urville and from the Italian station in Terranova Bay, which is named Mario Zucchelli. Our nearest station, however, is a Russian station named Vostok, which is about 600 kilometers away. Um, so we really are quite isolated here. Um, we're in a very isolated period at the moment where the temperatures now are so low, um, they're actually lower on the ground than they are at the cruising altitude of an aircraft. So it's too cold for planes to get in. So there's no in or out of the station uh, for the next couple of months. Um, Concordia station is one of only three stations, uh, one of only three inland stations that's staffed uh, year round. Uh, the other two are Vostok station and the South Pole station, which is a, is it Amundsen Scott? Yeah, Amundsen Scott, which is a, a, a United States station uh, as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, <laughs> getting a dry mouth. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we're very high up. We're at an altitude of 3,233 meters here. So we live at high altitude. Um, uh, and because of our southerly latitude, um, if you think of the atmosphere as spinning around with the earth, it's fatter at the equator than it is down here, um, which means that the partial pressure of oxygen here is much lower. So we actually only have about 60% of the oxygen available at sea level. Um, so we've all got a lovely excuse to be out of breath at the top of the stairs for a change, which is, which is nice. Uh, so moving on. So this is an aerial view of the, the station and the surrounding buildings. You can see the large black smudge is the station itself with the two towers construction. Uh, I'm sure there's a Lord of the Rings reference in there that, that I won't make. Um, and you can see the outlying, um, you can see the outlying, uh, so that's the summer camp that Rodolfo is gesturing to now. That is closed at the moment, but in the summer months, so from November onwards, uh, the numbers on the station will uh, Increase inflate massively from the 12 that we have now to about 60 or 70 people and that's where a majority of the extra people stay uh, so that's the main footprint of the station there and um, this is a nice drone photo of the station as you can see you've got the two tower construction uh, and it's connected by a tunnel which is also doubles as the main entrance uh, the orange container like building on the side there uh, that's what we refer to as the central. Um, that is where our water gets recycled. That's where our power is generated, our heat is generated, fuel is stored there. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a home for all of our technicians, uh, essentially, where they do most of their work. Uh, here you can see some more pictures of the station in various times of day and night. Um, and we move inside the station. So this is our dining area. Uh, which connects to a sort of uh, which connects to where we are now that's the other half of it that door in the background is where we're sat now in the living room where, where you'll be able to see us um, so we've got some games as you can see we've got pool we've got ping pong we've got table football um, and things to keep us entertained um, that's the kitchen uh, this is where Simone uh, spends the vast majority of his time that's Simone himself the the, the great man that he is um, so it's a professional kitchen and, and, and we can, naturally we eat a lot of frozen food here, um, but there's a lot of, uh, yeah, cooking done there. Downstairs from that, uh, in, in this tower, we have the gym. Uh, we've got a lovely new treadmill this year, which is fantastic. The other one electrocutes you, which is wonderful. Uh, so we didn't no longer get electrocuted when we go for a run. There's weights, there's an exercise bike, uh, and we also have space to do other stretching, yoga, that kind of thing as well. Here we have a video room. Uh, it's essentially a room with a computer, a projector and a screen. So we can watch films together. And there's musical instruments in there as well to keep us entertained. And uh, it's also a nice place to do teaching if necessary um, as well. This is the technical office on the ground floor of the current tower in. So sorry, the two towers are loud tower and quiet tower. We're in the loud tower now, which is where all of the workshops and things are. Uh, this is the technical office where the uh, technical guys um, manage their workload uh, and also communicate with Europe uh, and there's some storage in there. This is a workshop 
Um, so uh, this is an electrical, mechanical, uh, woodworking, metalworking workshop. We've got a great many tools and machines in there to manage any problems that we have here because we're so isolated. Uh, this is the water treatment uh, unit. Uh, so it's an ESA, so it's a European Space Agency design. Um, and it's a, it's a it was a prototype for one that's on the uh, International Space Station currently. Um, part of my role is to do uh, safety checks. Uh, so I test the water for bacterial overgrowth. I test the water for other certain ions like uh, ions and compounds like ammonia, phosphate, those sorts of things uh, to make sure the water that we use to you know, wash ourselves and things is, is safe. Uh, yeah, also um, it links into our drinking water system, but our drinking water system is, um, I monitor that as well for uh, bacterial overgrowth, but that comes from melted snow outside. Oh yeah, and we can uh, once the drinking water goes back in, we can recycle up to eighty percent of our water, which is very, which is a very nice number. This is the Centrale. So this is where we have three giant diesel engines, um, and these engines are uh, responsible for our power and heat generation. Um, that room naturally is very, very hot, uh, which is which is quite useful to us as we recycle that heat and we um, circulate it around the station as well. Um, here we have the hospital. Um, so the hospital here is, uh, is a hospital is a strong word, but um, it's, uh, so here you can see we have uh, some dental supplies. So um, Juzi, our doctor here, is also trained in, in, in emergency dentistry as well. Uh, so we can perform some of that. The door that you can see there leads to an operating theater. Uh, so we can perform emergency surgery if necessary. Uh, I highlight if necessary, hopefully, you know, we don't have to do that. Um, there has been one major incident on the station, which I'm, I'll come to a bit later on. Um, but as you can see here, we've got, uh, so this is the ground floor of the quiet tower. Um, yeah, lots of uh, ability here for medical provision and medical services. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, one of the bedrooms. Uh, so there are 16 bedrooms, I believe, on the middle floor of the uh, quiet tower. You can see there are bunk beds in there, but because there are only 12 of us on the station at the moment, we all have our own uh, room and our own personal space. Um, it's a very small space, but it's um, now that we all live on our own in there, it's, it's absolutely fine. So we go up one more floor to the top floor of the quiet tower, and this is the um, IT and communications room. Uh, this is where David spends a great deal of his time. Um, in here, David can manage our communication, so our radios, our satellite communication, our internet connection, our data transfers. And this is also the room, this is sort of our uh, aircraft control tower as well. When we receive aircraft, um, this is where we communicate uh, to them. Um, here we have the glaciology uh, laboratory, which is where Fabio and Dennis work uh, when they're not outside freezing themselves. Um, so in here, this is where they uh, process their snow samples uh, and perform their sort of chemical tests and bits and bobs. So this is my laboratory. You can see I've got the Scottish flag up there. You might call me a, a traitor. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is the ESA laboratory. This is where I perform my research, which is uh, human based. So I, in here, I perform uh, blood tests, cognitive tests, that sort of thing. Uh, moving on, this is where Marco spends a great deal of his time and manages his geomagnetism, seismological and astronomical projects as well. And here we have uh, uh, Rodolfo's laboratory uh, and in here he uh, manages his atmospheric physics uh, and, and more ast astronomy projects as well. Uh, so that's that's the station in general, this, uh, and, and that's what it looks like. The only room that isn't in the pictures is the room we're in now, and you can see this is our lounge. In here we have a, an extremely good coffee machine, um, and uh, we also have like some tables for socialising. This is where I, we have our aperitifs, and we've got millions of books as well. That um, I think out of the million books here, about 10 are in English, so I've been learning five Italian, and five, yeah, five, five Italian as well. Um, so that's the station uh, in general. Um, uh, I suppose now we can move on to uh, if, if anyone has any questions about, about what we do here or, or anything, to be honest, anything that comes to mind. Anybody have any questions that they want to ask? I know I had a few steps. So, do you, do you want to ask yours to start off with? Um. <laughs> 
Sorry, we're, we're, we're struggling to hear. Um, Mr. Robinson, would you oh, yeah. mind uh, repeating or, or come up to the mic? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have to make Do you have to make any physical or mental preparation before you undertake any research experiment? Okay, so so the question is, uh, do we have any physical or mental preparation? Is that is that right? Yeah, before, before coming to Antarctica. Out, but, yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, there is a certain amount of preparation. Um, most of it is in the form of screening, I would say. Um, so before we come, we have to have a similar, physically, we have a, a, a similar or the same uh, medical screening that astronauts go through before they go up to the um, International Space Station. Um, so we're, we have our risk assessed for many, many different physical problems. Um, and also there's a psychological assessment to make sure we're the kind of psychologically uh, ready to come and take the burdens that we uh, find here. For me personally, this involved, uh, <laughs> uh, mine was in French and at the time my French wasn't necessarily good enough. So quite luckily that I wasn't found out to be a madman. Um, and it involved um, a Rorschach test as well, which is a type of psychological assessment. So rather in depth um, screening. Um, there's also, we actually, because of COVID, missed a lot of training sessions that we had to do in Hobart, but there are team building exercises and briefings and um, explanations about what to expect as well. Um, does anyone have anything? Yeah, on, uh, on a normal year, we also organize a lot of uh, training concerning uh, firefighting and rescue. Uh, we spend... Uh, about a week uh, on the Italian Alps, on the uh, Monte Bianco, White Mountain, uh, with Mont, Blanc. Mont Blanc, okay, in France, <laughs> uh, with the with the, um, um, a military crew from Italy that teach us a lot of stuff, and also we spend several days with the firefighting team, Italian firefighting team, uh, where they train us how to, to face uh, a number of situations that we can have here. Uh, on top of this, uh, as, uh, Juzi, is, she's a doctor, but she's the only one, and she needs help uh, in terms of uh, uh, support in case of uh, some problems arrives. And also we are a little bit trained on this uh, aspect. Oh, brilliant. Right. Uh, Fran, do you want to ask your question? What's the scariest thing that's happened so far? Scariest thing that's happened so far? So, okay, so that may be different for different people. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, so the scariest thing, uh, I, I'll give you my version of that uh, question. So th thank you, Fran, for the question. Um, so for me, at the end, shortly shortly after Christmas, the um, Juzi is actually our second crew doctor. Um, shortly after Christmas, our original crew doctor, who we were due to spend the winter with, broke his leg. Um, and breaking your leg a thousand kilometers away from any kind of rescue is naturally rather scary. So um, in my role here um, as the rescue doctor, uh, I am also the second doctor on the crew. So for me, it was rather scary when, um, uh, our previous doctor Alberto broke his leg. It involved, um, I'm still rather a junior doctor, I've only just finished my foundation training so I've been uh, out of medical school for about two and a half years now. So for me that involved uh, with, with Rodolfo and Fabio's help um, uh, managing this broken leg. So getting uh, the doctor back to the hospital, putting a cast on, giving him pain relief, anti-sickness and dealing with any uh, risk of complications. So after a broken leg, for example, uh, fat emboli are a problem, can be a problem, as can um, neurovascular compromise. So the nerves and blood vessels in the leg can become damaged and clotting can become a big problem as well. And if, if you form a clot after a broken bone, uh, that can swiftly move to your brain or to your lungs. Um, so it was a it was a very scary time for me, um, where I had to, um, with with the support of the medical team here, I um, I had to learn a great deal of self confidence very quickly, and uh, and I eventually took over the medical service for about a week, 
um, as well and, and provided medical services to about 50 people on the station. So for me, um, that was uh, very scary. Um, however, uh, as scary as it was, it was also an incredible learning opportunity. I don't think there are any doctors at my level that have had such an opportunity. Um, well, for me, exactly the same. My, my scary was to have Nick as a full-time medical doctor. You know? I'm joking, obviously. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> and, uh, no doubt about the capability of Nick. But uh, actually, yes, that situation was very sc scaring us. Um, because also for, uh, for some days, quite, quite an amount of days, we didn't know how this uh, situation uh, could be solved. How a new full doctor could uh, come to assist the Nick in his activities and 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 our health. So we we pass some a couple of weeks, let's say, with uh, really not uh, having uh, clear <laughs> knowledge of our, of our future until uh, Josie fortunately uh, got to arrive uh, here in in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, Nick uh, took uh, 10 years more in that uh, couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's the scariest moment we've had so far. Um. <laughs> oh, lovely. I've got some um, more questions from people um, who weren't able to be here because of COVID stuff. We only allow one year group here at the moment, unfortunately. Um, and one of them is, um, I was wondering uh, how you get into the kind of job that, uh, on the on-site research. So how did each of you, what pathways did you take to get to what is quite an unusual and you know, unique career? Okay, so I'll, I'll hand the microphone around. I'll just briefly explain how I uh, got to do this job. Um, so the... My, my official title is the ESA MD, which is the European Space Agency Research Doctor. Um, I actually saw the role advertised on Instagram, uh, if, you can, if you can believe that. And um, I've always wanted to come to Antarctica, so I applied for the job. And the job required some research experience, which you get at medical school. Um, and uh, well, I got at medical school doing a five year course. Um, and you just needed to be a medical doctor with two years experience. And by the time I had come here, um, I had that. It's quite a selective process because uh, coming to Antarctica for a year with all the stresses and uh, problems that you face, um, that I think that lots of people want to do this kind of thing and it is very um, competitive. However, um, if you're passionate and just a nice person, uh, which I think is probably the most important factor for anything in life, uh, you can definitely get into this kind of work. Okay. And so the question is, um, how do you get into becoming, how do you get into like a line of work that takes you to Antarctica? Um, okay. Uh, for me, um, I have a master's degree in uh, um, environmental science. So the, envir the environment uh, for me has been always a passion. And, uh, and uh, Antarctica was always uh, a dream in the, po in the closet. And uh, when I had uh, the opportunity to come here, I applied for the, for the job. So for me, I have a degree in astronomy and a PhD in astrophysics and something like 15 years of experience as a researcher, but uh, this is not the only way to come to Antarctica, actually. There are many, many different uh, uh, jobs and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, possibility to come, not only researchers or doctor, also uh, technician, as you see uh, from the presentation. So the, the way to come here, it can be very, very different from, uh, um, from the, uh, uh, for the people. From my side, I also, I've been lucky because uh, I had uh, a professor at the university that came here and started to talk about Antarctica. And, and when I see the announcement, the job announcement during the past uh, uh, lockdown uh, last year, I think that uh, could be a nice uh, 
a nice trial, <laughs> a nice opportunity to come and uh, to spend uh, a different kind of lockdown <laughs> in Antarctica. <clears throat> I apologize for my English, I don't speak uh, very well, but I try to explain. For me, um, uh, come in uh, Antarctica uh, is a challenge uh, for my profession because uh, uh, the, here um, uh, one uh, doctor uh, um, have to learn a different way to, to work. Uh, we haven't uh, support of a hospital, we haven't support of uh, other colleagues. So it's, uh, it's important to change also the mentality in uh, our profession. It's a very, very, it's a challenge, very, very strong. Uh, me, I did three years of study in uh, technical science in uh, biology, chemistry, and uh, environment. And uh, I tried to come here since three years, I think, something like this. And this year, I was uh, selected to do the glaciologist year. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Charles. Uh, I'm a technician here. I'm the mechanic. Uh, how I came here, how to become like a mechanic here in Concordia, I think it's not much on the study, you, you don't need like a lot of study, but more like experience, you need to be able to to fix some issue on uh, this issue come with, uh, you know, your knowledge come with, uh, with time like in your work. So myself, I've, I got like a in England that's same as Australia for the study. Uh, yeah, I got a. Um, yeah, I did like all my apprenticeship as a mechanic, starting in France and finishing in Australia. On a, I don't know, I got seven years of mechanics. So how many? I think is I think it's like a bachelor. Oh, anyway, in a mechanic. So yeah, here I am. <laughs> I think it's important to note as well, because this is an Italian and French station, the only reason that I, I'm half French, but that's irrelevant. But the only reason that I'm here is because I work for the European Space Agency and the European Space Agency and the European Union are two different things. Uh, because Yeah, the, you know, the ugly Brexit word. So um, basically, I think that um, if you, you can pursue any career, really, uh, and if there's research to be done in Antarctica on it, or if there's work to be done, the stations need upkeep, there's technical jobs available and things like that. The equivalent in Britain would be to look at the British Antarctic Survey. And they have two stations on the peninsula, which is, you know, it's not the real Antarctica, but um, it's, uh, yeah, so um, I think you can pursue science here and you can pursue technical roles as well. Amazing, thank you. Um, so one of the next questions that I had um, but I think you've sort of already alluded to a little bit, um, was how has COVID impacted the base? Uh, so thankfully, COVID is, is should I? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so thankfully, COVID has had no direct impact on our station. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, it did impact uh, our lives before coming here. For example, um, we missed out on a lot of... Uh, the first time we met each other was in Hobart uh, as a crew um, because a lot of the courses that we were due to attend where we would meet and team build uh, were cancelled because of uh, safety precautions as a direct result of COVID. Um, we also got tested constantly on our way here because at the time when we arrived, COVID hadn't made it to Antarctica. Um, yeah, and Australia was extremely strict as well. We were actually really lucky to be able to get to Hobart because of the travel restrictions. Um, so it had a, it actually had a really, really big impact. We ended up staying in Hobart for a month before we could come here. Um, with uh, two weeks of that, we were locked in hotel room. Well, not locked, but two weeks of that, we were isolating in hotel rooms with, um, you know, monitoring for symptoms. And we were swabbed at the beginning and end of that. Um, and it was the same the other end in Europe. You know, whilst we were waiting for flights, we weren't allowed out of our hotel rooms and things like that. So um, it really has had a big impact. I think the reason why that is the case, if a COVID came here to Concordia, it would be catastrophic. It could be catastrophic because 
um, naturally we're so isolated here that any major um, illness or injury here it, uh, naturally is it, it's just not the best place to have it so um, we have facility to look after people but we can't look after people indefinitely here uh, would anyone like to add anything no yeah lovely thank you uh, one of the next ones was um, what have you seen for yourselves um, in terms of the direct impact of climate change Oh, so uh, who would like to answer this? Yeah. Well, actually, here in Concordia, fortunately, we do not see any impact of the climate change. We are really in the heart of Antarctica and uh, measuring or touching the climate change here would be catastrophic for the entire planet. Uh, different, uh, ah, yeah. different, it is the situation on the coast, obviously, where uh, there are impact uh, you see and you read uh, uh, quite often uh, new, uh, news about uh, uh, iceberg that the touch big iceberg that the touch or a very high temperature measured uh, uh, in antarctica for instance one or two years ago in uh, close by mario zucchelli I mean, on the coast has been measured uh, 18 degrees c so uh, plus 18 degrees not minus <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, the reason why uh, why Concordia is here is because uh, something like 20 years ago, uh, the European uh, Commission, let's say, started a project called uh, EPICA, and this project, uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. So you now you should start to see some pictures. So this project for see the um, <coughs> uh, the how do you say in English? The drilling of the ice to extract uh, uh, ice cores. So this ice core uh, now uh, then uh, can be studied um, in terms of content of uh, air bubbles trapped in the ice. This because the ice here in Antarctica is, is uh, let's say, the sum up of the snow since the very beginning of, uh, of the Earth, let's say. So uh, choosing the, <coughs> the, the places in, uh, place here in Concordia is because uh, um, the, um, the stability of the, of, the, of the ice grown is exceptional. And uh, we were able to study the, 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 cl the climate in the past um, back to something like uh, 800,000 years ago. So what uh, what is the major outcome of this study is uh, is pictured in this uh, in this graph. Uh, so this graph shows the concentration of the CO2 in the um, uh, in the atmospheres starting from about 800,000 years ago. You see there are that there were uh, uh, many oscillations of these values, but these oscillations were uh, all the time confined within a certain range. Uh, until uh, about 200 years ago, when after the um, um, industrial revolution, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the the concentration of CO2 started to increase and to grow, 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 grow up, uh, and it's now very, very at a value that is, uh, let's say, outside the boundaries of the graphic, as you can see. So, meaning that uh, the human uh, action as an impact uh, on uh, on the climate changes uh, but rather than this uh, fortunately here we don't see ice melting let's say <laughs> well, thank you very much um so the next one um is what oh sorry go on then. do you want to come up Say again, sorry. Um, so what does your human research involve? What does your human sorry, research I think the connection's involve? going a bit. And what, what does ah, your human okay. research involve and what sort of cognitive tests are involved? Oh. <laughs> so yeah, so um the 
just just as a bit of background to the hu the human research that um, I I perform here is um, the European Space Agency are very interested in Concordia because um, yeah without too much bravado um, Concordia station is essentially space on Earth um, it is analogous to uh, a station on the Moon or Mars or long distance space travel other than the obvious differences in gravity. Um, we um, here we face similar stresses and environmental factors that astronauts would face in those other situations. So that's why the European Space Agency are very interested in Concordia Station. Um, we also so the, I've run seven projects here. Um, the uh, types, yet broadly speaking, the types of um, uh, research that are being done are on uh, sexual health and sexual security. Um, which is something that has only been studied in mentally unwell and prison populations before. So it's good to have a mentally healthy population uh, in isolation to study. Uh, we're looking at stress and ways of predicting stress using EEGs uh, and uh, mindfulness as well and seeing if that's a way of mitigating stress and seeing if levels of mindfulness change over time. Um, I'm also looking at uh, biological factors. So a couple of my projects are looking at immunological changes uh, and immune expression and gene expression as well. Um, and also uh, there are other projects that are running, uh, not this year, that look at um, the microbiome of the gut and seeing how that affects mental health as well. Um, so there are cognitive changes. We know there are cognitive changes that happen when in isolation, especially with the light levels that we face, uh, the confinement, the isolation, the extreme environment outside. Uh, there's no opportunity for rescue. We live at high altitude, so we have lower oxygen. We know there are problems that are faced and we know that cognition goes down. It's about mapping um, how that happens and correlating it with other problems as well, um, like stress levels uh, and, and, and um, all the other things I've mentioned. The, the cognitive tests that we use um, are aimed at assessing, so there are like dice games, card games um, that are aimed at assessing decision making. Uh, they also assess risk taking uh, as well. So there's gambling uh, games uh, and things like that to be done as well. Uh, some of them are about spatial awareness. So there's a mental rotation where you're showing two shapes. You have to select whether they're the same or different as well. Uh, so your ability to manipulate shapes mentally um, and uh, there's also yeah okay, yeah absolutely memory is a, an important factor as well this uh, personally it's my least favorite of all the tests but yeah so we get shown a um, the annoying thing about these cognitive tests is the better you do the harder they become so um, <laughs> it will just push you until you fail essentially uh, which is which is a challenge um, but yeah, so there's memory. So you're shown up to sort of 12, 13 numbers at a time uh, in order and you have to remember the order and then it goes backwards. Uh, so memory, spatial awareness, uh, all of these sort of higher functions um, from the, the neocortex of the brain are tested. Oh yeah, there's one other project as well, which isn't a European Space Agency project I'm running, which is, yeah, is <laughs> aimed at uh, assessing, uh, there's a condition named dry eye, which is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, and the question is, is it an environmentally mediated disease? Because um, we live in it. Antarctica, a lot of people forget Antarctica is also a desert. It's the largest desert in the world. Uh, does that answer your question? Sorry, I waffled a bit there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. Nice and loud. Hi. So this is, um, you've mentioned some of the other, uh, some of the research you've been doing. What's some um, other research in other areas that you've been doing at the moment? Yeah, well, yeah. So I'll uh, I'll pass that on to uh, some of my other scientist colleagues. Um, from uh, a glaciologist point of view, uh, we are um, performing uh, several experiments uh, about uh, the. Um, uh, composition of uh, the pollutant, uh, uh, air pollutant. Uh, so we have uh, uh, several instrumentation for the air sampling and also uh, snow sampling to perform uh, chemical analysis of the uh, pollutant in the, in the snow. 
So for me, we study a lot of the atmosphere from a physical point of view and chemical point of view. So we study um, uh, concentration of uh, relative humidity, pressure, temperature, wind speed and direction. Every day we launch a, a balloon with a sound, for instance. Plus we have a, a number of uh, weather station. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, again, air sampling uh, uh, devices uh, to study the content of the atmosphere, or obviously on the, uh, at the ground level. Plus, we have uh, LIDAR. LIDAR are a very strong laser launched on the, on the sky. They, depending on how they are tuned, they interact a different height in the atmosphere to study different kinds of clouds. Uh, plus, uh, we also have uh, an instrument, a uh, very wide one, uh, called uh, Super Darn. It is uh, um, a kind of radar that study the interaction uh, between uh, the, um, the solar winds and the, the atmosphere to study and predict uh, possible uh, in, in interference, uh, let's say, on the radio communication given by the solar winds. Uh, plus, uh, I don't see Mark, but I can add uh, on his behalf, uh, we have study concerning astronomy. Here, uh, uh, we have the possibility to have three months of completely uh, dark continuous dark and this give us a, a, new, a unique chance uh, to study some kind of uh, astronomical uh, uh, sources. We do have uh, seismological uh, um, observation uh, because uh, we are very, very far away from any civilized uh, place. So any noise uh, uh, coming from our common life uh, is not present here, and and this gives us the possibility to study in um, with the fine details, uh, uh, for instance, um, the earthquake. Uh, a similar situation, a similar explanation comes from the study of the variation of the magnetic field of the Earth, because here we are isolated, we don't have uh, the noise of. Uh, the communication and the electronic devices present in our cities, so we can study in great detail also the variation of the uh, magnetic fields of the Earth. And now we have an alarm. <laughs> on cue. <laughs> Any other questions that you want to ask or go back to my list? Come on, come on. Um, so you mentioned that you have three months of total darkness. With um, plans of SpaceX putting all those satellites up into uh, the atmosphere, will that affect any of your research? So, so, with, so is the question, will, will the three months of darkness affect uh, any um, of the science that goes on here? No, the uh, plans of SpaceX putting uh, all those the network of more even more satellites up into the atmosphere. Will that affect the research and development that you have? The SpaceX planning to put up a lot of satellites into the atmosphere, will okay. that have an impact yeah. on the research you're doing? Yes. The answer is yes, not only in Antarctica but all over the world. The astronom astronomical community is uh, in some sense, uh, fighting uh, this kind of uh, project because, uh, I mean, when I say fighting, I, I mean uh, uh, try to find compromise with these companies uh, because obviously having a thousand of satellites, even if they are micro satellites orbiting uh, on the Earth, uh, will have an impact, a strong impact on some kind of uh, astrophysical research from Earth, obviously. So the answer is yes. And uh, speaking from a European Space Agency point of view as well, um, there is so much garbage orbiting our Earth. Space debris is a very, very undervalued and under-researched area. Um, at some point, there's going to be so much garbage, it's going to start crashing into other satellites. So space debris is, um, is, is, a, is a growing problem as well. Um, so that's something I think that ESA are looking at um, uh, investigating and investing more money and there are there are a few big startups at the moment company one of 
one of the companies is named Astroscale. Uh, their entire purpose is to uh, investigate and find ways of managing space debris and uh, creating a, a sustainable approach to space as well. I'll go back to my list. Um, so uh, the next one is, what is the biggest danger at the South Pole that people wouldn't expect? wouldn't expect it's not it's yeah it's not polar bears uh, <laughs> yeah what sorry loneliness yeah yeah i it's yeah i mean like i'm probably biased but i think that the mental health like, as charles has just mentioned the mental health aspects of being here for such a long time in such a small crew um i think that people overlook that a lot of the time um, also, just 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 a small point. We're not actually at the South Pole. We're very close to it, but we're close to the magnetic South Pole, but not the, the geographical one. Um, <laughs> sorry, much closer a bit of a pedant. Yeah, much closer than you. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, so I think the mental health aspects of coming here, the human aspects, um, are things that often get overlooked. People think that coming to a place like Antarctica is. Uh, you know, a great adventure and it's permanently fun, uh, which, and it is uh, fun a lot of the time, and it is uh, a great adventure. However, it's not a holiday. Um, it is essentially being at work 24 uh, seven. Even when you're alone in your room, well, yeah. Even when you're alone in your room, you're always uh, on call as part of a fire team or a rescue team or a medical team, or, and we're all subject to the, uh, uh, you know the physical effects and the mental effects of the day changing night and uh, light levels and so I, I think that's often overlooked um, I think a lot of people come home and they only speak about the easy parts or the extremely fun parts you know um, but it is a certainly it's like a, a marathon rather than a, a, a sprint um, has anyone else got anything they'd like to add it's not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's cold as well, but that's probably quite, yeah. <laughs> uh, lovely, thank you. So at the potential risk of offending your cook, and you can feel free to say no comment, one of the questions I got asked was, what is the food like? Yes, it depends on the chef. Uh, some years, you got a bad chef on some years like this year we got amazing chef so every single meal like lunch and dinner we got some amazing food and, uh, so we're really, really lucky on yeah for the food is really good we don't have any fresh food anymore everything's gone uh every, obviously everything is frozen but it's like fresh frozen so it's, it's not too bad it's pretty good yeah it is So we, we basically have a meal as, uh, as in Europe, it could be Italian, French or UK or whatever, but what we miss, as uh, Charles was saying, we do not have any more fresh fruit or fresh vegetable like tomatoes, like uh, salads, uh, this kind. These are really missing until next uh, November. Lovely, thank you. Um, so another question was, how do you navigate in Antarctica? Are compasses affected like they would at the North Pole? Yeah, so, so we use GPS, uh, essentially. There are global positioning satellites that allow us to navigate effectively. It's To be honest, it's rare that we go further than about a kilometre away from the station. So uh, provided the weather conditions are good, you can pretty much see where you're going. Um, there are, however... Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you just kind of walk and hope you get there and hope you make it back. <laughs> no, but um, you can, but there are, there are some outposts, if you like, uh, shelters where we have, uh, we've got a 45 meter tall American tower. That's about a kilometer away. Um, we've got a, um, a seismo cave, which is where the, it's a 12, 12 meters deep, about 12, 15 meters deep. Uh, like human made cave that we've uh, that's been here for a long time where the seismological sensors are underground that's about a kilometer away um, the airstrip is about a kilometer away as well and then Superdan is the furthest shelter is about two kilometers away so 
So our life is actually kept in quite a small little bubble, but during the summer, there are expeditions to other uh, places. And believe it or not, um, <laughs> when we have GPS, but um, you can just see the tracks from the previous people who have gone. Um, for example, like um, the raid. Tu veux parler de la raid? Oui, oui. Contan's going to speak. He's French, uh, but I'll translate afterwards. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Quentin. Uh, alors, sur le RAID, on utilise uh, des, du matériel, uh, le même matériel que sur les bateaux, du matériel maritime. Uh, tout ce qui est GPS, uh, c'est tout du matériel maritime. Uh, on utilise surtout des GPS. À l'époque, ils utilisaient aussi des radars, mais ça ne marchait pas très bien. Et donc, euh, voilà. Des radars, oui. Avec des... Il y a des tas de neige. Ils faisaient des tas de neige. Et ils essayaient de voir, mais avec les conditions météo, il euh, n'y avait pas de... Et du coup, on utilise des logiciels et on suit des caps. Parce que parfois, on n'y voit pas à deux mètres. Et du coup, euh, on regarde juste l'écran et on... On... on conduit avec l'écran. So, um, Quentin is our, um, uh, our welder and uh, multi-skilled technician here. Um, he's worked on uh, something called the RAID, which is the overland, uh, the ground-based resupply mission that we have sort of two or three times in the summer. Um, they drive giant tractors um, called uh, Challengers. Uh, they're essentially bulldozers, a um, uh, thousand kilometers from the coast to here. Uh, navigation is obviously an issue for them, but primarily they use GPS, uh, the same as us. However, they've got um, similar systems to boats, actually, uh, maritime equipment. Um, and uh, they use GPS primarily. Sometimes the conditions are so bad um, that they navigate using their screens and they can't see where they're going. They just have to um, plot a bearing using their GPS and follow that. They also have radar systems as well that can analyze the road ahead and tell them where to go. However, it's less useful. Um, uh, yeah. Also, I don't know about the compasses being affected. Well, compasses are not useful. Yeah. You are so close to the pole that yeah. every point. Uh, Oh, here. Okay, well, <laughs> compasses are, are not useful here because we are so close to the pole that uh, wherever you are, the compass indicates always the same direction, let's yeah. say. And uh, it's also um, uh, funny to, um, uh, to see all over the here, uh, the, the position where the sun rise and set, it changed so fast yeah. that uh, it's barely impossible to say here is the north, the west, the east. So it's uh, only GPS system can can help in the, the navigation. Brilliant, thank you. We've probably got about time to ask one more question, which will be um, from me, which is our school motto um, is achieving ambitions. <laughs> no, 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 the motto, is it a motto? The motivation. The motivation uh, of the school, is, um, what was it again? What was, your, what was your motto again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Achieving ambitions. So how do they, uh, what advice would you give to any of the students to help them in, in terms of achieving their ambitions in life? Yeah. I'm regretting asking um, that. <laughs> no, yeah, no, sorry. It's a, it's a very abstract question, but it's a very good one. Um, uh, for me, um, I've, I've had a quite a varied career and um, I, I started out as an aircraft technician in the army and, and now I'm a, a doctor in Antarctica. So um, for me, making that work has been, um, I think the three things I have found most useful are just being nice to people is absolutely essential for any job. I know that they're all looking at me funny because they all think I'm a 
swear word, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm not. Um, so be, being a nice, but just being nice to the people around you will you'll help form networks and uh, relationships that will ultimately help you um, in the future achieve your ambitions. Also, perseverance uh, is essential. So even when uh, you fall down, it's not the falling down that's important, it's the getting back up. Um, so when things are hard, if you just keep working, generally things will turn out in the way that you hope. If you stop and give up, um, then they're definitely not going to go the way uh, you choose. And also another uh, mantra I live my life by is no one achieves anything alone. Um, absolutely no one. Uh, astronauts in space um, heroic polar explorers, they're all supported by massive teams. We're supported by the, the wealth of two uh, leading economies in the world here, you know, so we're not alone here. So it's important to acknowledge that um, you are not alone. Um, anyone else? Um, advice in achieving ambitions? Yeah, for me, you need to put your head everywhere, like uh, try every field. Uh, not trying to keep focused on what you like, but trying to to look new things, or maybe you're going to find some new new stuff. On a, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a bit tough question too. Oh, thank you very much. We Ken has got one last question that she'd like to ask very quickly, if that's alright. Um, sure. As someone who's interested in environmental science, have you got any particular tips into getting into the tips for getting okay. into the field of environmental science. T uh, Conseil, uh, oh, can't speak French today. T <laughs> advice for getting into environmental science as a career. No, anyone? Do do science. <laughs> the the question is like, um, yeah. But well, me, my job is to work in uh, environment science. So the only advice uh, I have to you is uh, just do environment science at school and then do a job in environment. And that's it, I think. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Geophysics could be away, chemistry could be away. After uh, some base, scientific base, you have to look for uh, um, little uh, roads that go to environmental science. Environmental science is not a rich science, but it will be grow its importance. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the, the goal there is just uh, try and experience the, environmental science is a massive subject by the sounds of it. And it's made up of lots of individual things. So I think you can pursue individuals. So through your A levels and through you still do A levels, I think, but um, through your A levels and through university, I think you can pursue something you're passionate about um, and still end up under the umbrella of environmental science. Um, so I think that what Dennis and David are trying to say is that um, you can you can look through chemistry uh, set of binoculars or you can look through chem uh, physics you can go through any raw yeah there's technical aspects to it as well and you can work environmental science is such a broad um, area that it's got many many different uh, routes in so I think that at your level um, it's just kind of finding out what you enjoy doing and then trying to find a, a stream into environment science that kind of matches that, I would say. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, well, we are probably just about out of time on our end. So um, I'd like to say a huge, huge, huge thank you um, from all of us for giving up your time today and taking um, so many of our questions as well. We're extremely grateful. Um, and also um, to wish you all the best for the remaining time that you have at Concordia. Yeah, thank you very much uh, from all of us here. It's a pleasure 
um, to, to speak to schools and students and things like that and, and, and talk about what we do here. So thank you very much for your attention and for your thoughtful questions. <laughs> and for your forced applause as well. Thank you. <laughs> Right, okay. Thanks very much, guys. Bye. Thank All you. Bye. Thanks, Mr. Robinson. Cheers, gang. Bye now. Take care. Bye bye.